I got involved in APHA leadership and um, uh, found that fascinating from 98 to 2002 and was elected um, vice chair of the board and then chair of the board um, for my fourth year. And um, after, I'm glad I did it when I did because it was the perfect timing. Um, I stayed involved with APHA uh, until 2004. I think in 2003, by that time, 2003, Ed was involved in APHA in his position, and so we came to the conference together. I can't remember what city it was, but I was flown by CDC. He was flown by uh, by the state of Hawaii. We had to fly on different airlines because we had to fly on wherever we had the contract, but we were able to stay in the same hotel. <laughs> And uh, we attended different sessions and whatnot, and that was that was that was good for him in 2003, because then he got diagnosed in 2004. And once he was diagnosed, I let everything go, I let APHA go. I was involved. I'm still a member of ACE, American College of Epidemiology. I was um, had my name submitted to run for the board of ACE in 2004, and I withdrew it. As soon as we got his diagnosis, I withdrew everything. I was ready to retire, mm -hmm. but uh, my boss, Bill Sappenfield, told me, "Hold up, wait, wait, don't, don't retire. You know, you need your job, and we'll, you know, what do you need in order to keep working?" I said, "I need to not be supervising. I can't be going to conferences anymore because CDC would have me as a senior epidemiologist mm -hmm. represent them in conferences. I can't do that. I can't do anything else. I have to stay with it. I need to. I can work for Hawaii because he said, "Well, what are you going to do if you retire?" I said, I stay in Hawaii, I'm going to work, but I can't you know, travel. He says, well, you can stay in Hawaii and work as a CDC employee. We, you know. So that was good. That was very good for CDC. So. And I guess one last thing. You were the website for Safi. www.s. But, but. Oh, you, that, that. How, that it, how it happened. How it happened. Yes, Ed did that. So. He didn't do it originally, right? He did the original one. Oh, he did the he original one. He did website? the first one, not this one. And there's been several iterations. Yeah. Um, so, because I'm trying to think, we were out in Hawaii. We got there in '96, and he was in his math, MBA program '98, um, '99, something like that. It was around that time, and he was taking a course that he had to create a website. And this was before software. Oh. oh my goodness. He had to learn HTML and create a website. Mm -hmm. He was also creating a business. And so he created a small website for a consulting business that he wanted to have after he got out of school. But he was looking for something else. And I said, well, Safik needs a website. So he created the website for Safi. And this was 1990? This would have been 99-ish. We could maybe find that what website. It might be interesting to look for it in archive.org. Well, oh, if you know how to find uh, it. Well, we'll see. There's, an, there's a web arch, an internet archive where they just go around finding websites and saving copies of them. Because the, the domain name is still the same. Yes. No, okay. I know. I know. But, but anyway, I'll, afterwards, so I'll, I'll look for he it. He created the first website for SPER as well. Really? Huh. And I was the administrator for abstracts. SPER started doing online abstracts in the late 90s. Hmm. And um, that was my job. And uh, because, well, because jobs. Uh, yeah, but he created the website, and then it was under his consulting company. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was a small job, but it was really interesting for me. So I would actually take annual leave. We would have the we'd have the abstracts come in on a Friday. I would take annual leave for that Friday, so there wouldn't be any conflict of interest. And then when they would come in, I would actually manually separate the name and the title, the title and the authors, and make those blinded copies. 
and then make those and make those files and then send the blinded copy to whoever was taking charge that year of sending it out for review and then keeping the documents and then once the reviews came in most of the work I could do on the weekend but that Friday I would just work all day and then at midnight Pacific time he would shut down the website so that nobody else could send an abstract in and we did that for several years did that um, into well, he didn't die until 2008, so right into it was maybe the year that he died that I gave that up, and some other company took that over, mm -hmm. and some you know company took over the other websites as well. But yeah, Is first one for breastfeedinghawaii.org, um, we did the first one for that. HawaiiPublicHealth.org, hmm. we did the first one for that. All the organizations that I was involved with in mm -hmm. Hawaii, he the was website. their volunteer website. Creator, the first one. I mean, you know, and it was very, you know, we would get some um, graphics sent to us from people, and we just had a lot of fun with keeping them up to date. And uh, I tried to, I think Safi is the only one that we continued with after we moved from Hawaii. And he had taught me how to manage it to a certain extent, but I, I really didn't know how, so we had to get somebody else to take it over. Is there anything else that you want to say on the recording? I don't think so. I think I've said more than enough. Okay. No, I don't think you've said more than enough. I hope some of what I said will encourage other people, other women who are thinking about doing things who have children to know that you can, you know, it takes a village, but with family and friends and prayer. I didn't think it's anything about prayer, but a lot of, a lot of prayer helped me through. And I, People say, well, how did you do what you did? I didn't have a career path. It's just sort of serendipity, but I stayed open to the opportunities and then just sort of um, always said if I wanted to be an astronaut, af astronaut, I could have, and it's a good thing I never wanted to. <laughs> but whenever they see something that I want to do, eventually I do it. So now, 50 years after starting nursing school, I'm back in nursing school. Um, when I applied, they told me to send, get resume, get, I need to get a reference from a professor in my school. I said, most of my nursing school professors are probably dead by now. <laughs> so fortunately, I'd taken some courses in, at the University of Alaska in Anchorage when I went up there. I, I was looking for a bibliography program. They didn't have one, didn't know about online programming. So I took some statistics classes and some... Um, a chemistry class, some things of interest, some things that I had said 20 years ago uh, when I was at UNC, when I was um, doing research and I needed to know more about something and I was auditing classes and said, someday I'm gonna go back and take these classes. Well, now I have to say thanks to the Veterans Administration and some veterans benefits and I had some educational benefits. I said, I'm gonna, I, I can do this now and I can take classes. And so you, you're never too old, it's never too late to learn. Try to stave off Alzheimer's. Just keep learning. You're extraordinary. And keep active. You are extraordinary. <laughs> well, I am Cheryl Blackmore Prince. <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs>